welcome to Chats the Television Podcast, Season 12, Keeks Chats. My name is Alan, and I love him. I love working here. <laughs> I don't want to let him down. It's Magellan. Hey, how's it going? Hello, my friend. Welcome. We're in the owl zone now. Uh, <laughs> the owl zone. <laughs> we're in the owl world. That's my favorite Sonic the Hedgehog level. Uh huh. Yeah, the owl zone seem, sounds like the, like talk radio twin peaks podcast <laughs> yeah the, the owl zone the owl do the owls are not what they seem <laughs> absolutely and if you couldn't already tell them john and i really are doing this so that we can get on a talk radio show uh that was our audition <laughs> tape yeah just make those relevant again if you could out there <laughs> yeah i want to be a shock uh, jockey without the like sexism honestly um, <laughs> we just buy to Magellan, I'm excited because we are, as usual, talking about two episodes of a cult classic TV show. This season, we're talking Twin Peaks, and we watched an episode, a yep. very special episode of Twin mm-hmm. Peaks today. Uh, but before we get into it, I would like to introduce the guest that we have for this episode. Uh, I'm so happy that I could kiss him to death. From Lost in the Movies, it's creator of the Journey Through Twin Peaks video series, writer Joel Bacco. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. I feel like I should put on some sort of like radio show affectation now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the show, Joel. Yeah. Folks who have been longtime fans of Chats know that I used to be on a podcast called Fireside Friends. Um, and Joel was on an episode way back in 2017 where we talked about Lost Highway. Um, and I've always considered you one of my favorite scholars about uh, David Lynch and Twin Peaks. And when we were going down the list of people that we wanted to have on to talk Peaks with us, uh, I mentioned that you were, you know, number one on the list uh, between the Journey Through Twin Peaks series and the writing that you've done on LostInTheMovies.com. I think that you have a great perspective, and uh, we wanted to get you on for this really big episode. Yeah. Oh, thank you. This very big episode in question is Season 2, Episode 7, Lonely Souls. Uh, this episode was directed by David Lynch. It was written by Mark Frost, and it aired November 10th, 1990. Um, Magellan, can you do me the honors of telling me what happened in Lonely Souls? Sure thing. In this episode, Mike's reaction to Ben Horn prompts the police to put out a warrant for his arrest. Hawk finds Harold Smith dead in his apartment with a suicide note. Uh, Alan, how do you say this in French? J'ai un M solitaire? Yes, which means I am a lonely soul. Or I have a lonely soul, one of those. Leo's muttering helps Bobby find a secret tape in his new shoes. (laughs) Mr. Tajimura reveals their big secret to Pete. Sarah's crawling through her home, and she sees a white horse as Bob takes control of Leland, luring Maddie into the living room and killing her. At the roadhouse, a beautiful performance is interrupted by the giant. It is happening again, and hearts are heavy with a sense of grief. Big one, folks. It's, the, it's, a, it's considered a pivotal episode of Twin Peaks. And again, that is part of the reason why we wanted to have you on, Joel. Um, I know that we picked this episode for you in a way. I, I suggested it at least. Um, but I'm curious, and what we ask all of our guests is, what is your history with Twin Peaks? How did you get into it? And uh, is there anything in particular that you really uh, like about this episode? Well, my history with Twin Peaks was um, not until DVD, until 2008, when they came out with the, gl- the gold box. I finally caught up with it. I had tried to watch it a couple years earlier. Uh, renting it on Netflix, but all they had available at that time was season one. And when I say season <laughs> one, I mean post pilot season one. So you couldn't even watch the pilot. My gosh. You had to start <laughs> wow. with episode one. So of course I didn't know that. So I, I, I did put that episode in first and was like, why does everyone, why does this seem like it's not the first episode of a series? <laughs> like everything's already going on. They, they're they already, you know, know about this mystery and then i sort of figured out what was going on so i waited Mm. until they Mm. were all available and uh, at that time i remember getting to this episode and just being like i have to see what comes next and converting you know this was i say back in the day at dvd netflix i still use dvd netflix all the time and i hardly recommend it but you know when most people use that so i had all these different cues and i converted them all to like twin peaks cues so i could like get all of the next episodes at the same time and not have to wait in between. And uh, I raced to the end and then watched Firewalk with me. And then I ended up going back and rewatching it over the next few months uh, mm. to create like an episode guide on my site. So my second time through the series, I wrote about uh, each episode as I, as I watched at least the first half of the series. Uh, and then many years went by uh, in 2014. 
I got back into the series in a big way. And that was, of course, the year that they announced season three and they came out with the missing pieces and all that. But it was just total coincidence that I got back into it right at that time. So the universe was working. It's magic. <laughs> and uh, and then ever since then, really, I've just been putting out a lot of Twin Peaks related work, uh, video essays, podcasts. Um, I wrote about each episode of The Return when it aired in 2017, like right afterwards and that type of thing. So it's it's been a big part of my um, my film website, lostinthemovies.com. Uh, a lot of work there has been Twin Peaks related, just put it that way. And also, I guess I should mention, since you mentioned it in the intro, uh, the biggest aspect of that has been a video series called Journey Through Twin Peaks, where I go through the whole series up into the return. I'm still working on videos for probably next year that are going to be more focused on the return uh, and just going through different groups of episodes, different themes and aspects of the series that way. You know, we we watch a lot of YouTube here on chats, but like something I love about your your series and your your essays in general um, is that they kind of have a almost impressionist vibe. Like they are not the traditional like guy talks in front of camera for 45 minutes about a TV show that he likes a lot. Um, they are interspersed with a lot of great music choices uh, and and full clips of the episodes and uh, and your commentary and reading quotes and reading writing. Um, and I think that's a that gives it a really great, unique uh, voice that you don't see in a lot of TV criticism. So I think that was what initially drew me to, to your series, honestly. Oh, thank you for that. And I would just say it's very much in the tradition, I think, of Kevin B. Lee, who is one of the great video essayists um, and kind of the inventor mm -hmm. of the form. Um, in the mid 2000s, at least in terms of it being a thing on like YouTube and on the internet. So if people like him, I definitely encourage them to look up uh, his work as well and uh, kind of go from there. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting videos out there. I actually have fallen out of the loop a little, but I've been getting back into creating them and hopefully watching some more of them again recently. Yeah, they're, again, just really great. And we'll be linking all of that in the show notes, of course. I want you to get yeah. your due there. Um, but as for today, we're talking Lonely Souls, um, which is a great episode. Um, like I mentioned before, I know there's obviously the iconic uh, Leland Bob scene. Uh, but is there anything about this sort of era of season two? Because we talk a lot about on this podcast how you know, the early goings of season two, while very exciting, can kind of feel still a little bit rushed um, because of mm -hmm. what the network was doing with the show. Um, and this this episode kind of represents the crescendo of that. It, it to some people, reads as a finale of sorts. Um, right. And so I think overall, like, is is that, do you think that is the case for Lonely Souls? Do you think this can be read as a finale? And like, what do you, where do you think it falls in the overall scale of, of Twin Peaks? Uh, I really like that idea, and I've I've heard a few people say it when, uh, particularly I remember there was one intro cast where they were watching it for the first time, and they were like, that feels like that's the end, like right after it's over. And I've heard different <laughs> reactions too, like some people are like, on to the next one, can't wait. And like I, in a way, felt like that when I first saw it, because as I said, I started renting all the all the upcoming DVDs like at once, so they'd all be ready. But uh, I I like that idea of ending it that way, almost like a Sopranos style ending. I like the idea of this as an ending because it just has a full tragic feel in a way. Cooper is sitting there, he's staring up at the curtains and he failed essentially. When you, when yeah. you are stopping at this episode, uh Cooper did not succeed in his mission which was well certainly to find the killer, he hasn't found him yet. Uh, but he also didn't stop him from killing again. And I if I'm not mistaken, there's no, like he almost gets to Renette a few episodes ago, but there's no like other victims of uh, Leland uh, or Leland slash Bob. We can talk about that too mm -hmm. in light of this episode, but there there are no other victims. I don't think after Laura, there's Teresa Banks that they mentioned before her. Right. But up until this point, the killer has been yeah. on the loose. Um, well, I suppose Jacques, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> sure. Yeah. How how, how many people will mourn Jacques? Them, but you know <laughs> yeah. now, yeah, he's now he's killed Maddie, and that is, uh, or at least you know, that's the impression we're left with as 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 uh, the episode ends, and that's a whole other level of tragedy. So this idea that Cooper had a mission. He's this brilliant guy. We all love him. We're rooting for him. 
I've heard people say like they expected him to literally like kick in the door of the Palmer house and be like, I've got you and like race up and arrest him or something when they were like yeah. little kids watching or not, hopefully not that little, but you know, kids watching it. So yeah, a long winded answer, but I do, I do really like that idea of this as a sort of a finale because of the way it encloses Twin Peaks and gives it this kind of grandeur now. Yeah. And there's definitely some stylistic choices in this episode and callbacks to the pilot that it, it seems like there's an intentional like closing of the circle happening here because this is only the second time that we're back at the roadhouse, seeing this particular singer putting lyrics to like Twin Peaks songs. Um, This is us reenacting the grief that we saw in the first episode. Donna's crying again, uh, much in the same way that she's crying in the pilot. And so it, it, uh, it ultimately, you know, we have to ask ourselves this question of like, what does resolution mean in the context of a story like this? Um, and in this case, yeah, like you're saying, Joel, if you stop here, resolution just means like, you know, resolving to the understanding that like we're in a cycle that, that kind of exists, uh, and persists and and there's like a ongoing tragedy to that. Yeah. I think in the video that I, the video essay that I created to go with this episode or even just this part of the episode, cause like normally I cover a group of episodes in a mm-hmm. video, but the killer's reveal was so, I mean, I, I basically made a video that's like longer than the actual killer's reveal. Cause there was so much to <laughs> pull right. apart just in that one sequence. And at right. the end of it, I kind of say like, this feels like it could be, you know, this could be the end. And for David Lynch, in a way, at this moment, it is. I mean, I don't right. think it's spoiling to say he doesn't direct for a little while again, you know, right. after directing right at the beginning of season two and coming back for this. It's like he kind of takes a break himself. So, um, but the story has to go on because it is a network TV murder mystery. So you yeah. you have to wonder when you see this episode for the first time, like, where can they possibly go from here? Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. right. Something that I wanted to um, pull out of that the the video essay that you made for this episode is when you talk about the feeling of confronting the fact that Leland is the killer and the sort of duality of like we are uh, shocked but not surprised. Uh, like it it makes sense, but we we didn't want it to be true. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Cause I, I found that really interesting. Yeah. I think I remember feeling something like that. And I did have a little of a spoiler before I watched it because I was watching YouTube clips of actually the scene where Bob climbs over the couch. Cause I was, I just uh-huh. loved that scene so much. I kept going back to revisit it before I got to this episode. And unfortunately at the end they had prompts of like, what do you want to watch next? And one of them was Bob kills Maddie. So I mm. knew that was going to happen. Um, Mm. which takes some of the sting out of it initially, unfortunately, because it's good to feel that the first time you watch the episode. But I didn't know who Bob was. Like, they didn't say that. So I think in my head, I thought maybe Bob, like, can take form. Like, it it didn't really, even though Mike kind of says it in the previous episode, like, the idea of, like, Bob has a host, and there are all these clues leading toward, like, Bob is in somebody. Like, I was just kind of thinking, okay, maybe he'll, like, materialize and attack maddie or Mm. something um and maybe that won't even be the killer's reveal i don't know but when it happens i think a part of me thought well it would make sense if it was leland because maddie's staying with him and and more importantly just like he's been having this breakdown for 14 episodes now like there's obviously something more going on there but you don't want it to be him and i i basically said there were kind of three reasons why um it's so disorienting One of them is that we just like the character and both Mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, this is putting a little bit of a timestamp like this. The series could still go on. They could stretch it out for many episodes. But now that you know he's the killer, it's a little bit of a a warrant for the for Ray Wise as Leland Palmer. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. we've got our reveal now. How long till they catch him or till something else happens with him? Like how, how long till the other shoe drops? So just on like a practical level that's kind of a disappointment like oh we were enjoying watching this performance but then more fundamentally as a character 
we're really drawn to him. He's very sympathetic in a lot of ways. We enjoy his company. He's fun to be around. And so now to see him in this dark light, that's very grim. And then also the fact that uh, it, the confusion of like, well, what's going on here? Like, this isn't a clear answer. We've been waiting for 14 episodes for a reveal. And the reveal is it was Leland. Well, it was Bob. Well, maybe it was both. Maybe it was what's going on here. So we almost have more questions mm-hmm. than answers. And then the third part that I think is most fundamental that I focus on in there is, and, and this is actually kind of brushed over more in the show than I think people realize when they go back, because there's a lot of discussion around it, at least now there is. Um, but the fact that he, that Laura was being abused by Bob, like sexually molested by him, and that mm-hmm. is really, they, they, that's always been implicit, uh, just with everything the show tells us about Bob and about Laura, but it was never really said explicitly until this episode, I don't think, when he's reading the diary and he just says right, Bob was molesting diary. her for years. Yeah, and so then to find out in that episode, oh, and also it's her dad is like, ooh, that's, you know, I think it really comes down to what type of show you think you're watching. And I think that was my biggest, um, that was like the most trouble that I had with this episode when I first saw it was, I'd seen plenty of like dark films with really serious subjects dealing with incest or anything else. But I was in the mind. I think I uh, Twin Peaks had sort of put me in the mode and Lynch is very good at doing this of like building a sort of a false sense of comfort of like, well, this isn't hmm. this. This is flirting with darkness, but it's never going to go quite that far. Like it's more of a fun murder mystery with some dark aspects to it. But when you get to this, it's like, no, that's about as dark as it gets. So this yeah. it's like we just took the bottom out of the the floor we thought yeah. we were on and we're we're plunging down now. That's I think that's how I felt when I first watched this episode, like kind of overwhelmed by this idea that that uh, I thought I was watching one kind of thing and it was turning out to be something else. Right. That there's and they and they do such a good job in this episode of like setting you up to be nervous yeah. that something is coming between yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean I mean, there is like something eerie about the comfort of the home when it's like they're listening to What a mm-hmm. Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. And it's the intro to that song. It's not even like the part that you want to hear. It's like the the weird like <laughs> him talking for five minutes. And yeah. and I paid a lot of attention to the camera work in that scene where I mean, the camera work in this episode in general is amazing, honestly. Yeah. But in that particular scene, the camera is like afraid to linger on the Palmers. Like realistically, what they're doing is it's like really Leland, far away from them. Yeah. It's far away and it's behind the record player. It's behind the couch. It's like hiding. Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It feels like it's creeping up on like a tender family moment. I've had like my yeah. dad put his arm around me while we listen to music. Like this is a deeply normal familial thing. They're going to miss Maddie. And then yeah. to to bring that back in, and that set back and back as like the event occurs. And then to have him say, you know, Leland says, you're not going back to, <laughs> to Missoula, Montana. It's like, Everything we thought was comfortable and normal is actually awful. And in a way, it summarizes what Twin Peaks is in, in some ways about. Yeah. And we open on that painting of Missoula that he ends up smashing her head into. Like, that's oh, the opening yeah. of that sequence at the Palmer shot, mm-hmm. or oh, at the pa- that shot at the Palmer house. Yeah. And, it, you know, we're also building off of, like, previous sequences, unsettling sequences to serve this episode. Just the record player has already been imbued with so much creepiness since the episode where Leland put it on for himself and danced yeah. alone. And we felt like that was off at the time, but didn't really consider why. And then to have that culminate in before we ever see Bob in the mirror, we just see the record player spinning without music. And like that alone tells you Leland is the guy before it even shows you that moment creeped me out so much. And, and I thought it was, part of the genius way that twin peaks takes these mundane things and imbues them with an otherworldliness and, and a horror that uh, I think is, is one of the unique strengths of, of the show. It's funny too thinking about this and how iconic so much of this is for people who watched it. Like it's not, and this is good in a way because it lets people kind of go into it blind. I feel like this episode isn't quite a part of the canon of like TV history as like, say the pilot or like the red room sequence maybe is, mm-hmm. you know, if you were doing like a montage of like great right. moments in TV or something, it's like this, it, it's, it's almost one of the disorienting things about it is to like stumble across this and be like, and I think that's part of that sensation of 
feeling like, uh, you, you know, what type of show am I watching? I think I'm watching one thing. It's like, you think you would have heard of something like this before you ran into it in, in person. You know what I mean? Like you would think if yeah. it, that just, it would be part of your general knowledge as like the way that people know about like who shot JR or, right. um, like a certain, like Lucy, I mean, to use a silly example, like Lucy at the cake factory or whatever, which is, you know, you'd think it would just be one of those iconic moments. Maybe it is a little more now that Twin Peaks has kind of come back in the past decade or two, but I still feel like if you're going through it, the shock is almost like, this is like a work of art. This is like a great film shoved in the middle of a TV series. Like, how did I not know this existed? And if this existed, like what else is out there that I, yeah. I thought, you know, I knew in this landscape. Yeah, I, I think I, I've been reading recently from this book, Critical Approaches to Twin Peaks. It's like a collection of essays um, mm-hmm. about the show. And the introductory essay talks about um, what makes a cult TV show cult. And like a big part of that is one of the three sort of tent poles of something being cult is the the capacity for the audience members to like, take events out of context and, and sort of like, you know, reference them and, and use them as like fun toys or, or signs of like being in the in crowd or whatever. And so many other moments in Twin Peaks serve that goal. And this doesn't, right? Like there's, yeah, there's nothing, it fun can't. <laughs> this, there's nothing fun or culty about like, remember when, when this happened in, in uh, lonely souls. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting how campy cuteness, Dale Cooper saying damn good coffee or whatever, like that stuff needs to be here in order to make this particular moment. So horrifying, but it also in the discourse about twin peaks overshadows this, which is ultimately what the show is about, right? Like yeah. this isn't a show about coffee and pie. It's a show about, familial abuse and grief and the horror of the things that people do to each other. Um, but, but yeah, <laughs> we're not talking about that at the water cooler cause it sucks Yeah, to talk about. It's really fascinating to look at articles from the time because most often if there's anything even written, cause the show was actually already unpopular at this point. Like it had, the season oh, yeah, really. premiere was kind of the turning point for that. So like a lot of the articles were like, who cares who killed Laura Palmer? Like that was like their sort of <laughs> tag going into it of like too late. Yeah. The show's already lost its audience, but you know, there was some writing about this and a lot of it's like really flippant. Like, Oh yeah, it was, it was her dad. He saw a crazy guy in the mirror. Isn't that wild? Anyways, on to like, they, they kind of avoid mm-hmm. dealing with it in a very glib way. I find, um, so that is interesting that it was on at a time where Twin Peaks was a water cooler topic and they still couldn't quite manage to like squeeze it into that context. Mm. Yeah. And, and it does, it's uh, going back to this being a, a sort of final episode. I mean, the, this moment happening also really undercuts all of the like investigation stuff and mm. saps it of a lot of it's like yeah. fun because yeah. we come to understand it not as like us working towards figuring something out, but as us avoiding confronting an obvious potential answer. Yeah. Um, and we're going through this really circuitous thing of like, Oh, now we have like Jacques Renault's parakeet or whatever. And we've got this flesh world magazine. We have all these clues. We went to Canada and met all these people. And all you had to do was like go upstairs in the Palmer yeah. household to get the answer. And there's something about this happening that also like, uh, for me, it reminded me of Bobby at, at Laura's funeral saying like, you want to know who killed her? We all did. And we all killed Maddie too, because we just weren't confronting the obvious potential of, of it being within the family. Yeah. And there's a crazy meta aspect to it too, of where like Lynch and Frost did not want to reveal the mystery, um, which or reveal the answer, which to me is so interesting because it is, it's just this crazy paradox because it is 
the high point of the show in a lot of ways, like as, as a work of art. And it, it's like, it feels like, like everything we're saying about it here is true. It's fulfilling what Twin Peaks is all about. So it it almost makes you wonder like, what does it mean that they didn't want to reveal it? Were they also sort of like the characters in the audience and not wanting to go that, or was there some other reason? Was it something they just felt had to come at the end? Like that part of it, like what Lynch says about it makes total sense as like a dramatic argument like that was the show you killed the goose that laid the golden eggs and all of that like on the surface that makes total sense but when you dig into it and how powerful and good this episode is like it feels like well okay but like at the same time yeah what's the story didn't do it yeah and like this is it's it's i don't know so it's it's funny it's this weird contradiction of like i totally understand what he's getting at and it makes total sense on one level and makes no sense on another level (laughs) Yeah, it feels like he is, and I I know this is a a thesis that gets developed a lot more, uh, when we come back to to Lynch directing again. But it feels like he is getting frustrated by the people asking who killed Laurel Palmer already. Yes. Like the fact that that is the key operating question. It's like, well, you guys wanted to know. Here it is. It's the worst yeah. possible answer you could have expected, and you're gonna sit with that, and then I'm out of here. And you yeah. guys, the network ordered 22 episodes, so you're getting whatever's whatever scraps I gave Mark Frost and company, like basically it's why the show takes such a weird turn after this, as we know, as we've discussed, but like mm-hmm. it definitely feels like he is just putting it in your face so that you, you know, like, well, this is what you wanted. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very confrontational in that way. And what I found fascinating, and I know we just said like this, this reveal takes a lot of the steam out of other investigation plot lines. Um, but there are other plots in this episode that I want to briefly touch yeah. on um, mm-hmm. because a lot of them have the common theme of like people just saying the quiet part out loud, like saying the thing that they've been mm. hiding for a long time. Um, this fe- it feels like Lonely Souls is an episode where people are are just committing to something finally. Um, I think that's the common theme here. So we start with uh, a very straightforward but sad one. We 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 practically open on some haunting imagery. Um, as Hawk decides or investigates Harold's uh, apartment and finds him hanging in the back uh, by a noose and has the letter uh, JNM Solitaire, I, I, am, I have a lonely soul or I am a lonely soul. Um, yeah. And it's like, we need to start thinking about like, who was Harold to us? What is he supposed to represent? But also like, this was a sad man who was like harmed by people he thought he could trust and that did not have a, a have, anything left in life to live for he just you know suicide is so it's so troubling the way it's portrayed in media very often um i do think it's a little bit used for shock value here to be like <gasps> like check it. he's there's his like the fact that they show his legs i'm like you really could have just not showed me that yeah. and and just said it um but again a lot of this episode is about just like making things explicit so hmm. i get why they chose to do that but i still felt like this amongst all of the plots in this episode was the weakest because it's just like well, I guess this is tied with Hajimura, but like, okay, Harold's yeah. dead. This <laughs> yeah. plot line no longer matters. Could could I um play? I think Harold's death takes on meaning when James and Donna talk about it um at the Roadhouse. So if I could just play it, a brief yeah. part of their conversation. Not anybody's fault. He was a sick man. I think he was hurt inside in a way I couldn't figure out. Hurting, so. And I'm I'm really interested in discussing what you both think about um James saying everybody's hurt inside as a response to Donna really trying to process like her guilt over this because in part I, I'm trying to parse out like is that James being dismissive or is that James speaking to like the the conclusion of the episode you know this idea of like everybody's hurt inside like is that a, a, a something that the show is ultimately saying is the point of all of this <laughs> james is being a little narcissistic uh yeah. but it also yeah. it also is you know i think i think this show this episode is about it's about the community as much as it is about laura because it's about it it's it really perfectly fulfills the show up to this point in that sense particularly stuff in season 1 where it's like everything is tied to Laura's death and circulating around that 
this idea that like everyone is feeling this grief and it's intertwined with whatever they feel about their own lives as well and just sort of mm-hmm. amplified by that and they're all they're all kind of like in that last scene they're like kind of united by their isolation in a weird way you right. know i mean lonely right. souls these are not like the real episode titles but this is like the perfect title for this you know it's something the german tv network made up or something in the 90s but this right. is the perfect right title for this episode like it's so good Mm -hmm. yeah 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 it's i i think i agree definitely that james is being a little bit like callous here also uh it's it's sort of like when you you tell somebody who doesn't understand you you say oh i'm really depressed and they say well everyone's kind of sad and it's like (laughs) you know there's a solidarity to that but also like it's not helpful advice i mean donna is like in a bad place and yeah he's not getting that but I think it also is, once again, the curse of Twin Peaks is that we, we bury our true feelings and we don't like talk about these things. James is not equipped to talk about this. He's a teenage boy uh, with a tough childhood. Like uh-huh. He doesn't know how to talk about Harold. So he's kind of like, let's not. He died because he was sad, just like everyone else. Like I don't need to think about what leads a person to develop agoraphobia or like why you know us t- trying to take the diary was triggering for him. Like I can't process that right now. Um, yeah, but it is. Yeah, it's it's briefly touched on, but it is it is a bummer. Um, I did think that actor was really great, but mm-hmm. I agree. The show's already packed with a lot of folks. Yeah, um, I I want to talk about what this episode does with Ben Horn. Um, yeah. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Because, Good topic. Yeah. From from what I understand, Ben Horn at this point, you know, at, when you're coming into the episode, is meant to be like red herring you know, number one, uh, you're supposed to be willing to believe that he killed Laura Palmer. And we have this whole confrontation between, between him and Audrey where, um, they say the following. Did you sleep with her? And then Ben pauses for a while. And then Audrey says, Did you? Yes. And so there's this whole, like, I don't know, this kind of meek moment from him. And then that goes into him. She says, did you kill Laura? And he says, I was in love with her. And I don't know. What did we think of that scene? Because it it seemed to me like they were trying to tidy him up a little bit or something or, or re- redeem him slightly or make him seem like a little bit more naive. And I, I wasn't really sure what to make of all of that in the Ben Horn stuff in general. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I will say that what I love about that scene is that's a realistic portrayal of like how a daughter can pull truth out of her father. I mean, like you, you I've seen that in my own life and I understand that there are secrets you can hide from your work and from your lovers and from your wife. But like when a daughter asks her father, like, can you with your words, tell me the truth of what you think of what happened? He's kind of like the character of Ben Horn d- dissolves in front of her. You know, the side, the little wooden thing that he has on his desk that says Ben, is just like not even in frame. Cause it's just <laughs> like, all we're left with is this sad man. Who's like, yeah, I mean, I did <laughs> like, I'm not going to tell you I didn't. My, his pause says more than him even like eventually admitting it. The fact that he has to consider right. that is right. like he's already basically admitted to it before he says yes. And um, she plays so her really card. Like she plays her card really well of finally revealing to him that she was the girl at One Eyed Jacks because I think without that he might sort of bluster his way through. But as soon as she says that, like it's over. He just has nothing left in him to resist because. And it's funny that it's that because that was obviously sort of like a quasi incestuous moment where uh, that, you know, ultimately in this scene, it leads to the false implication that Ben killed her. But it kind of points toward the real conclusion of who killed her in this episode, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. You you made a great point in that vi- in your video essay as well, which we're going to keep referencing because it's great. But like the show has been telling us that incest is at the heart of this mystery for a long time. The Ben and Audrey plot basically exists, and that Hester Prince scene, for as weird as it is, is giving us a hint of like, hey, it's not just like 
underage sex with girls, it's specifically incest, and you need to understand that that's what we're talking about. Um, and it's something that the show continues to underline. Like we cannot look away from the truth of what like the horror under twin peaks. I think it too. It's like it's interesting how. You can see all those signs. Now, I think sometimes about, like, why is it that nobody is quite ready for the reveal, even though there's so many sort of signposts? And I mean, that's not, people did predict at the time, and there were people who were, like, watching it regularly who, like, Leland was their prime suspect. But it still feels like the general reaction is surprise. And I think part of the reason might be because we're used to seeing, like, incest in a film or a show as kind of like a subtext or a kind of a. Mm -hmm. it's more of an allegorical. So like we could feel like, well, this show is saying something kind of Oedipal or something like that um, in the way that Blue Velvet mm -hmm. is, where, you know, this young guy goes into a closet and he watches this older woman and older guy perform this weird ritual and then he's pulled into it. And it's like, oh yeah, you can see all of the like implicitly kind of Oedipal ancestral stuff, but it's all, it's not like in the film itself. It's like a reading you can make of it. So I could, right. I, I think people could watch Twin Peaks and see all these things and be like, well, we could sort of extrapolate from that this this kind of abstracted idea about all of these these primal themes, but it's not actually going to go there directly. And that's what feels so raw about this episode is like, it then goes directly, well, I mean, even in this episode, it doesn't quite, because it's more about him killing Laura, but, but that, uh, that element comes to the forefront because we know well it's it's the killer's reveal kind of masking and not very well masking at this point the fact that it's like the abuser's reveal you know yes right the true horror of that the final moments of this episode are actually mostly implicit uh, yeah. because you have to do a little bit of legwork to say yes like the person like if you read this literally leland whose hair has turned white because of something sees yeah. bob in the mirror and then we cut back to him. So that is the show without words telling us exactly Bob Leland, same thing. Think about them in the same context. Yeah. You then have to make the logical jump yourself to go, they've been talking about Bob. They've been talking about the third man. Yeah. I basically need to go back in my head, rewind to everything they talked about Bob and put Leland in those scenes because that's who was there. Yeah. Bob, is, uh, Leland is the third man that we've been looking for. Yeah. And, um, I mean, that's something we haven't even really, and I don't know how much we can say about it at this point because, you know, we're, we're people are watching this for the first time. and But it's just mm -hmm. interesting that that's a whole other element because we've been talking about the implication of the fact that Leland was the one who killed Laura, but also the other aspect of that is Leland is ostensibly possessed by this spirit. Like, what does that mean in terms of his... Right culpability and his relationship to Bob and all of that. So that's like a whole nother layer to it. I don't know if you want to kind of lead the way into that, knowing how you've talked about this stuff up to this point or, yeah, um, you know, with the audience's expectations in mind or whatever, or experiences. Yeah, I, I can definitely say that you, the audience watching for the first time had all the, I, like I gave you all the clues officer, everything mm -hmm. we've said so far. But when it comes to like where the line is drawn there, I think that's also up to interpretation. And yeah. that is what I would like to punt to our spoiler segment. Sure. Some of those yeah, answers, like where the, yeah. yeah, we'll definitely yeah. come back to like the Leland yeah. Bob split. But yeah. what we have here textually without spoiling anything is that Leland and Bob may or may not be the same person. There's a possession thing going on because Mike has talked about like, you know, having being inside the body of another man. So we know that these are the same thing. And everything else you can kind of are logic jumps that I'm helping the listener make. But like you I'm not these are not spoilers. These are just yeah. things that you would have been picking up on by now. Um, yeah, well, and I think uh, an important, you know, like we're saying ultimately like this episode is answering the question like you said Joel of who murdered Laura Palmer, but it's also answering, you know, darker things about who who has who abused Laura Palmer. And I think there are visual moments that make it clear to us, um, make that clear to us. The The thing that struck me, and yeah, again, I think we'll have to talk about the implication of it in, in the spoiler zone, but cutting between when Leland is holding Maddie and spinning around and we're cutting between Leland like crying on her face and Bob aggressively kissing her face and 
that moment makes clear to us that like Bob's not just a guy who murders and likes to put letters under people's nails or whatever. Like this is a sexual thing too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're, we're, we're watching that. We're not, you know, we don't have to see the entire like act in order to understand w- what this is all about and, and who Bob is or Leland or however we want to delineate them or not. Um, but regardless, it's not just violent. Like it, it is sexual and we see enough of that to understand that, that that's the case. Yeah, that's, that's well put. It's, um, it's, it's been present in the show all along, but it's in this moment, yeah. it's like we, you know, it's funny how it's like, you know, murder is a pretty serious thing, but, but murder mystery, you can have kind of fun with that. Like there's no real fun in like a rape mystery, yeah. you know, like that's not, right. but that is kind right. of, but, and that's, what's so interesting about Twin Peaks to me is it does play with kind of the fun aspect of it. And it does, th- there's actually a really interesting article from this time. It's one of the few that really engaged with this episode in, with any depth. And it's from a uh, Catholic magazine, I think Commonweal. And the author actually kind of rejects the episode. Like he is offended by and angry mm-hmm. at it, um, which is not a conclusion I really agree with, but his way of getting there is just very interesting. He talks about how like, the show has been having fun and teasing all of these mystery elements and clues and stuff that all kind of had these sadistic sexual edges to them. And now we're kind of having our faces rubbed. And he says, it feels like somebody is like slowly poisoning, like increasing the dose of poison and you get used to it Mm. until suddenly Mm. you're dead. Like that's, that's kind of the analogy he uses of like how the show was getting you used to all of these dark things and putting it in sort of a playful way until suddenly you're here. And this is where it leaves you and you feel kind of stranded. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the other thing that that is, you know, so that does make this feel like the deadly dose, <laughs> uh, I guess, is that up until this point, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, um, a lot of sexual imagery or conversations about like who has carried on a sexual relationship with Laura you know, how consensual was that? There's been tons of that prior to this point in the show, but I think prior to this point, you could reasonably interpret that as somehow Laura got caught up in like a bad situation or she got caught up with drugs or or whatever it is. And along with that came exposure to, you know, people like Leo or Jacques Renault um or whatever that brought along with it this sort of um unpleasant sexual edge and this moment is saying actually that the sexual part of it is like the root of it yeah rather than it being a, a product of whatever you might be assuming about Laura's i don't know substance abuse or mental illness or whatever those things are actually the product of of this much deeper trauma um and and that is like also a part of what makes this so unpleasant um to to face and and to acknowledge yeah i think a lot has been said about um the the scene itself but also like you know when we start to wrap up here we can talk more about the final everything that happens in the roadhouse but it's clear in the town of twin peaks that like energy transfers really easily there's a sort of loose energy and and vibe that goes across different people's hearts and souls in Twin Peaks. Uh, that's why Bobby and Donna cry. In a way, I think that they are a, not only aware that something bad has happened, but they might even know exactly what happened. Mm. Um, I don't remember where the show li- it draws that line explicitly. Um, but just like we keep bringing up these ideas that people knew, people have we we could have known the clues have been there. I was just thinking when you know going back to the Ben and Audrey scene. That like Ben has had a picture of Laura Palmer yeah, on his in his desk. office and nobody Nobody's nobody investigating this has been like, hey Ben, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's just been there. It's been it's been sitting yeah. there completely in plain sight. I mean, Leland's been sitting there in plain sight. Like there are just all these things that are like, oh, that was just there. And maybe in my heart of hearts I did know it, but I didn't want to think about it. And I wanted it to be, you know, mm-hmm. everyone like we um have asked friends who've watched the show for the first time who they think the killer is so far 
And mo- like some of them have even started to be like, I guess in the back of my head it could be Leland, but that seems weird. And it's like, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is weird. <laughs> um, Speaking of weird, I want to briefly touch on just the uh, early on in this episode when we bring Mike to the Great Northern. Um, and he has the seizure when Ben Horn walks by. Speaking of what John said earlier, like the red herrings, um, there is such a fun quality to that scene. We always use the Great Northern as an opportunity to bring in weird, funny extras, and they get a bunch of sailors who I guess are here for like a festival, and they all have <laughs> bouncy ball, like really loud, loud bouncy balls, um, that are just bouncing while Mike is like bouncing in his head, like as if this guy knows, if this guy. And then it's Ben coming through that. That presumably is what causes him to have a seizure and like pass out. And you're like, oh, this has to be it. It has to be Ben. We did it. We're so smart. What a layup. We're done with the episode. <laughs> Solved it. Yeah. Um, I loved that. I love the, I, I always love the way that this, this show handles like the mundane and how serious things can happen while like chaos is happening around you. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just had a really great energy. And then, uh, Speaking of reveals, um, we have two other big, re- I guess, reveals in this episode. Um, we have the Mr. Todd Jamura one, which we can touch on briefly because it's one scene. Um, if you remember last episode, that how we punted to the spoiler zone to talk about this, we didn't know that it was literally going to be next episode that he no, was like, yeah, we didn't hey, know. guys, what's up? Um, it's me, Catherine. But he only, but she only reveals it to Pete. Yeah, because- I, have a, I have a clip of that, actually. I'll, I want to play that real quick. Yeah. Dummy, it's me! It's me! Catherine. You look terrible. (laughs) Just terrible. (laughs) Just terrible! (laughs) The only person that comes out of this episode happier is Pete uh, Martell. Yeah, good point. <laughs> but uh, what a this stuff is so dumb. I hate this stuff. It's, it's also more, like racist as hell. Yeah. It's, I Why is she only, I guess she only him. reveals it to Pete because maybe she does actually like him. Maybe she does love him and it's sincere and there's something there. Yeah, yeah. it's it's weirdly <laughs> like maybe well I guess in the season one finale you get that scene between them in the office. So there is that as precedent. Yeah. But it's like one of the few times in this series so far where you get any sense that there is there's something other than just like pure frost in their marriage you know <laughs> right right yeah that same felt not genuine though and this moment is very it does feel very genuine even though this is like a costume reveal yeah. um, I, I guess it also serves to just tell the viewer like Hey, stop thinking hard about Mr. Tajimura. We don't know what we're doing with this, and we're gonna, and everyone else is gonna be like, she, uh, as Mr. Tajimura, Catherine is speaking to Ben, and he says, "Oh, all of your checks cleared or whatever. Your accounts are cleared with the Tokyo Bank." And it's like the the level, the degree of work that Catherine had to do to like make this fake person and clear bank checks with a different continent is mind boggling, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Diane, 9.28 p.m. I'm sitting here on a chair. It's pretty soft. Diane, it's I, 9.28 oh, p.m. I uh, just ate a really great I just, sandwich. I think that the armrests are a little... And the sandwich was really good, but did you, I mean... We... I, I did book I, yeah, the... So, I booked the Diane, voice. the recording space is ours. Diane. Right? That's correct, Diane? Diane, if we could just check the yeah diane so basically i was going to start talking about the tuna sandwich um you know it was diane i called the way yeah it's it's funny how people always rearrange this in their head like you're not the first persons i've heard say like i can't believe it was in this episode like i remembered it as being a totally different thing like people right. it's like your mind just resorts it because it's like no, they couldn't put that ridiculous like stunt. Yeah. Not even just in the episode. <laughs> it's inserted into the montage leading up to the killer's reveal, which there is yeah. some cleverness to that because it's obviously like you said it's a it's a reveal, but it's like, you know, a completely trivial one. Um Right. But like that, you know, that 
that is so strange that it's it's like in the midst. Like I think we get that scene after yeah, the first shot we... in the Palmer house of like the camera snaking along the floor. It's amazing and how like Lynch... Sarah Palmer's on the ground, right? Yeah, and then we cut away yeah. to like Mr. Tojimura in the shadows. Like what? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, I wonder so, if anyone yeah. has ever watched this episode and thought that Mr. Tojimura was like the killer of Laura Palmer. <laughs> I thought that that's where the episode was taking them. <laughs> I think you could be fooled, honestly, if you didn't. Not that not that they would be the killer, but like that you don't know it's Catherine. Yeah. Um. Be- yeah. Sure. The costume is. I mean, it's sufficient, but also like, as soon as they she switches voices, you're like, that's all right. I felt stupid. <laughs> I, I didn't realize it. I don't think until the previous episode when Pete offers the milk, and then I'm like. Oh no! Oh my God, that's what this is. Because it was so ob- it was obvious that something weird was going on. Like they've talked about, right? There was um a Japanese actor on set. I think the guy who played uh, Josie's, um, the, you know, Mr. Eckhart's like assistant, who's mm-hmm. trying to take who ends up taking Josie away. He's actually Japanese, and he was like saying he's like. I knew this was not a famous because they were presenting it. This is a whole, I guess you can say this part now too. It is a Fumio whole behind Yamaguchi. the scenes thing where he, they were cloaking it from the entire cast and crew who this wow. actually oh, was. Really? So like nobody, oh, and apparently uh, Jack Nance like believed it was a real Japanese actor. Everyone else kind of knew it was somebody in Whoa. like weird Asian makeup, but he like thought he like went up to Lynch after, they had scenes like that. I don't like that Japanese actor. He's a weird guy. I, I don't like the sense Whoa. I'm getting from him. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Which is oh, amazing. No. And apparently, like Peggy Lipton was convinced that it was Isabella Rossellini, like oh, it, that this hilarious. was like her cameo on the show or something. So like, yep. but this Japanese actor is like looking around, like, are you kidding me? Like, this is not. First of all, this isn't a Japanese person. This is clearly like a white person in makeup, <laughs> and also oh, like. God. I know, you know, I'm from Japan. Like they're claiming this is like an esteemed Japanese actor who is wide, like widely renowned. It's like, what? this is what are they? What's the name? Like, um, I can't remember the Fumio name. Fumio Yamaguchi. Fumio Yamaguchi. Yeah, they're like, oh, this is the great Fumio. Everyone, keep you know, pay respects. Like you gotta. And he's like, what is this nonsense? <laughs> oh my God, that's, that's funny. like I if think you it, were like, guys, it's. A... Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say it's it's in uh, Brad Duke's book, uh, the oral history of Twin Peaks, which is amazing. Um, Reflections, it's called. There's like he he interviews that actor, and he's kind of like he's kind of like laughing about it. He's like, you know, this was maybe they pulled the wool over everyone else's eyes, but I I saw what was going on here. <laughs> it. I was just gonna say it's like if you were filming a show in Japan and you were like, this is Bradley. Pitson or something. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I believe you. And they're like, yeah, he's uh, like an esteemed American actor. He's been in movies since the 80s. And you're like, sure. <laughs> right. Sounds good. Okay. That's funny. But Mr. Tajimura the, is, is up. The jig is up, at least with Pete and with us, the viewer. Um, but yeah. I'm assuming they're going to keep the script going for a while. That's also presumably why we forget when it happens. I mean, I, I think when they were first introduced in our spoiler segment. We were like, when does, when do we find out? We like looked it up or something and we're like, wait, I don't remember when exactly. Uh, it turns out, yeah, it's in like one of the most powerful episodes of the show. And it's just a C plot of like, Hey, by the way, here I am. Um, and then the other just like silly plot line is uh, one of my favorite. I really hope you clipped uh, Leo here, Magellan. Um, uh, I have a clip of it. Yeah. Okay. Can you, can you give me that? Yeah. So I, so Leo is saying this phrase over and over again, and I clipped a, that in a funny response of Bobby's later on when Bobby brings Leo his shoes. Whose shoes? No, you knucklehead old shoes. Leo, you know, he gets pretty fixated. I like that line a lot. No, old also, shoes. Also, Mike is back, by the way. Super weird yeah. to see. Hey, hey Mike. <laughs> What's up, man? <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah. I was happy to see him. Um, but yeah, Leo's Leo's mumbling about new shoes, and then Bobby figures out that he's talking about his own shoes. He opens up the heel of the steel-toed boot, and there's a tape inside. I don't even remember what's in the tape <laughs> or what's on the tape. Yeah, me neither. I just 
was so I don't know why I find it so funny though the niches like it's just like it doesn't sound like the actor who plays Leo <laughs> it's like so high pitched yeah it sounds like a bird or something like that yeah, yeah. exactly or like a bird call Waldo yeah. <laughs> right it sounds like Waldo yeah he ate Waldo and Waldo's talking through him exactly <laughs> yeah um and I, I liked an association with this this moment the fact that we're finally starting to see Bobby and Shelley have problems that they don't know how to resolve um because i think we were talking bef- in a previous episode of ours about how it was frustrating the way the show was depicting um you know this idea of like bobby and shelly are trying to scam for welfare or insurance or something and like they're gonna get rich off it and now this episode is showing uh you know the the cruelties of the system and just how difficult it is for them to get by and uh how kind of tenuous their situation is because there's this moment where uh and i'll, I'll actually just play it there, there's this moment early on 42 dollars for the month how am i gonna make it how are we supposed to survive on 42 dollars a month we shelly i can't keep telling my mom and dad that i'm spending the night at mike's what, what time is it i'm missing economics as it is we met me and leo Bobby, you said you're going to take care of us. I am, Shelly. I am. I want you to take the necklace back. We don't have to do that. Uh, there's something really satisfying to me about Bobby being like, I'm a high schooler. I, I just remembered. I yeah. gotta go. <laughs> we haven't touched this in like 14 episodes or whatever, but we are in high school. Yeah. Or he is. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's fun that they remind us of it. Also, that clip exemplifies another thing that I noted about this episode, which is that the music on this episode in general, it's really loud and it's really good. Uh, yeah. It overpowers some of the scenes to the point where it feels like a music video. Like in the moment when Ma- uh, Audrey goes to Cooper to tell him about like her dad, and it's like the music, it's just like the jazz drummer is going off. He's like doing a <laughs> solo and she's like, yeah, Cooper. So my dad, it's like, it's, a, it's kind of awesome. Honestly. Um, I think they really do think they think so much about music mixing in the show and sound mixing, yeah. like the power of the record skipping in the, in the Leland's house scene, uh, really does a lot of work there, but, uh, yeah, that covers everything else. Big. Um, one of the other m- important images or I guess memorable images from this episode uh, is that Sarah uh, who has collapsed from something uh, is like crawling down the stairs, you know, those terrifying, terrifying stairs that we've seen since the pilot. She goes through the living room, trying to find help, trying to call for Leland. Um, And then right before she passes out, she sees, and if you're watching either the Bravo cut of this series or you have the Blu-rays like I do, you know that uh, the log lady has been talking about, um, you know, uh, pale horses and, and fear of things that have been right beneath the surface. And right there, Sarah sees a uh, a white horse lit like a heavenly light and then passes out. Um, we can we can we can pull that apart in the spoiler zone. But I thought that, you know, it's another, it's one of those images that even the Simpsons parodied. Like it's, mm-hmm. you know, the white horse in Twin Peaks. We want to we want to mention where it happens. Um, but finally, the Leland stuff happens and it's intercut with uh, everybody being going to the roadhouse per Margaret Lanterman's instructions. And Julie Cruz is performing a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song there. Um, one of the most important aspects of Twin Peaks is its music. And I think that she brings so much to this scene, uh, mm-hmm. both as like it being ethereal and being uh, like enticing in a way. And everyone's enjoying it. You get to have a moment of, qu- of like chill where it's like Margaret is eating peanuts. Cooper is like just enjoying the, the tunes and Donna and and. Uh, and James are just like sitting in a booth, hanging out, talking about their lives. Also, Bobby is there. Apparently, Dana Ashbrook just like was on set, and Lynch was like, "Yeah, get in here. You can be in this scene for for sure." And they like put him in as Bobby <laughs> just to be there. Um, and so the ensuing moment happens, and we get the return of our buddy, the Giant, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, he says again, "It it is happening again." And uh, once the murder actually occurs, we cut back. And the the old man, who we know uh, always appears around the same time as the giant, goes over to Cooper and then to, to Bobby. And he tells him, I'm so sorry. And 
I almost cried at that moment, and yeah, I don't, I don't too. fully understand why. I mean, it, it's a great delivery, but it's just like you're already wrapped up in the emotions of what's happening, and then this guy saying, "I'm so sorry." It's almost like the show being like, "Hey, we just put you through a lot. Take a breath. Like, sorry about that." <laughs> yeah, right. And um, that's the moment where we fully accept um, that what Joel, what, what what you were saying earlier, we fully accept like this is a, a failure. Like we, we yeah. have failed yeah. to keep this from happening again. And we don't really accept that until the waiter guy says, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Everybody cries. Donna's Donna's bawling her eyes out. Uh, yeah. Bobby is like feeling something. He's, he's starting to choke up. And again, I, I, I sort of read this as like, not only do they know something has happened, but they might know like exactly what happened. Uh, as if it's been under the surface and they've just been like, kind of pushing it aside. I, I was just partly amused by how much Maddie is like exuding one week from retirement energy. <laughs> yeah. In, yeah. In they really episode. set that, <laughs> which is amazing. People don't see it coming. I mean, yeah, she's like, yeah, I, I want to go back to a life of my own. And it's like, Oh girl, you're about to die. Oh no. Um, yeah. And then there was one other clip that i had that's a really short that i wanted to play it's when they're gonna arrest ben horn and this is his response go away get out of here go on go on i'm gonna go out for a sandwich <laughs> it's so funny that he thinks that's gonna work uh yeah that's I'm rich people sure. energy right there yeah that go. is a get great yeah, see rich. that is such a great moment because on some first of all like yeah why okay you're gonna go get sandwich secondly He's literally in the middle of a business meeting. So like his attempt to act casual yeah. is only drawing more attention to the fact that like this is, you know, this <laughs> yeah. is ridiculous out. And then he goes for like his like secret exit in the wall. It's like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's like not even a door over no. there. He's just walking over there. <laughs> he wants to Homer right. Simpson into the bushes, but he's Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh I wanted to mention one other Part that we didn't really touch on, which is the diner stuff. The the thing that really struck me, there's a couple things um, with both halves of that sequence. One is just when Nadine comes in and like crushes the drink. She's like covered in the cherry juice. It's all red. It's like this wacky foreshadowing of what's to come. And then she literally says to Ed, I could kiss oh, you to yeah. death. And she's like grabbing him and all this stuff. So it's this weird, it's again, sort of like with Mr. Tajimura, like, a comic counterpoint to the really dark stuff that's going to happen later. And mm. then with Norma and Shelly, yeah. it's just kind of poignant because and I, it, this didn't occur to me until I don't even remember what it was that triggered it, but it, I realized it's kind of like a, it's also sort of a parallel to the Leland Maddie situation because mm. it, there's a lot of like, I think something nobody really talks about with this episode because there's just everyone's so focused on we're revealing Lars killer is like, well, wait, why does he actually kill Maddie? And I think, you know, you could sort of right. draw different conclusions. Right. You could say it's just Bob striking while he has the opportunity. To me, the most interesting reading is that she wants to leave. And it's it's like Leland slash Bob, whatever, you know, overlap there is there. It's like he can't stand to let, sort of lose control of her in that way, you know? And that's... Right. That's right. kind of a motivation right there. It's like, oh, you think you're going to leave? Well, I'll show you. And if you look at how Leland reacts in the scene when she tells him she's going to go home, it's like, it's very weird. Like, he's clearly, like, really upset. And then he puts on this whole performance of, like, well, you know, it's, uh, it, we understand. You've got to go. It's your time. But, like, you can see, like, for a moment there, he's like, what? You think you're leaving? So to then watch the scene where Shelly tells Norma she has to go, and Norma is, like, completely understanding, and she's, like, mm. comforting her, and it's, like, really sincere in a way that the Leland Maddie scene was not, where she told Leland she was going to leave. Mm. That, to me, is, like, another mm. interesting yeah. parallel there, where it's like, well, this is how things should have gone, you know? Right. That's really interesting. I hadn't noticed that. Well, yeah, the parallel there is definitely, it's definitely in the text, but also, like, so many of the shows that have been inspired by Twin Peaks of the small town murder mystery series uh, end up coming to that same conclusion that like you can't leave because when you leave, this doesn't work anymore. We can't keep secrets. 
Uh, we can't control people, so anybody who tries to leave is killed in one way or another, whether it's financially or literally. Mm-hmm. And it's fascinating, too, of course, the place she's going to go back to that she's killed. I mean, he, he's, he you know, shoves her head into the painting that says Missoula on it, and Missoula is Lynch's right. birthplace. So there's a weird sort of circular thing oh, going on there, too. Weird. And that's what he says also when he slams exactly, her head. Exactly, yeah. Like, Leland said, "You're you're gonna go back to Missoula, and that's when she dies." Yeah. Hmm. hmm. A lot going on there. Yeah, I feel like we should wrap the main episode up so that we can talk about some of this spoilery stuff that mm-hmm. I'm excited to talk about. Um. So, some housekeeping plug stuff at the end here. If you want to get in touch with the show, there are a couple of ways to do that. You can email us chatspot at gmail dot com. You can follow us on Twitter twitter.com slash chats pod you can join our subreddit reddit.com slash r slash chats pod and you can support us on patreon at patreon.com slash chats pod um and there are bonus episodes for you at uh three dollars and above well there's some at one dollar as well but most of them are three dollars or five dollars and if you support us at five dollars you get thanked at the end of the episode just like Cat, Marcus, Nick, Pat, Fenden, Ryan, Six, and Stefan. Thank you, folks, for supporting us uh, on our Thank Patreon. You. We appreciate it. And um, the only other... Oh, and thank you to Camilla, of course, for our podcast art. You can find her on social medias at Camilla Strader. Uh, I was also going to say, by the way, Joel, if, if you want right here, you can plug your stuff. What do you have, um, you know, in terms of podcasts and things that you want people to check out, Twitter, et cetera? I would say my website is lostinthemovies.com. I'm Lost in the Movies on YouTube as well and on various other platforms and Patreon and all that. Um, one thing I would recommend of my own if people want to check out if they've seen um, – Twin Peaks, all of Twin Peaks, and uh, or at least Firewalk with me, and um, some of like Lynch's other films or, or something. I did a video before Journey Through Twin Peaks called Take This Baby and Deliver It to Death, which is a paraphrase from uh, Jennifer Lynch's book, The Secret Diary of Laura Palmer. And uh, it mm. is basically like a meditation on the idea of somebody trying to figure out uh, or trying to confront the identity of their abuser, sort of inventing this figure of like a evil bad guy that then the hero comes and vanquishes, and then sort of slowly realizing the hero himself is is implicated as the abuser in this sort of story. And it uses hmm. all of these early Lynch films to kind of structure that way. Like it it, it sort of um, it starts with hmm. like intercutting between Eraserhead and Firewalk with Me, and then it. Uh, it goes through like blue velvet and dune and wild at heart and all this stuff kind of thrown in there. And that was something it was like created very impressionistically. There's no narration and it uses like the Maddie murder sequence as like the central, like there's just a long clip of that near the end of the video is kind of the climax of the confrontation. And then kind of ends with a coda that's uh, ties in with the elephant man and fire walk with me. So that's something I would recommend just if people are coming off this episode and want to kind of like, uh, meditate it on it in a less sort of overtly analytical way. Uh, they can check that out, and that's mm-hmm. on my mind because I was just I, I'm doing an Eraserhead podcast, and I was just revisiting some of that stuff, um, looking at what I had done with Eraserhead in the past. So that came to mind. Mm-hmm. So yeah, cool. that will be that's my self promo thing. Yeah, the only other thing that we do to close out the episode is we share. Uh, Joel, each of us will share what we call a chatsum. Are you familiar with the Vlasic snackums, the small pickles? No. <laughs> They're like snack size pickles. Are, are those, I think, yes. Um, okay, I know what you're talking I didn't know that's what they were called. <laughs> yeah, so we, we like to give people a snack sized pickle sized media recommendation that they can enjoy between now and our next episode. Mm. Um, so, you know, we'll give you a, a minute to think of one. Um, Alan, if you want to share your chat some first. Kind of a light chat some, but I've been enjoying the heck out of uh, Splitgate, which is a new free-to-play. Not new, actually. It's apparently been out for a couple of years, but it's a free-to-play uh, first-person shooter multiplayer. Mm. Uh, mm. It's got all the annoying trappings of your average modern-day first-person shooter. It's got loot boxes. It's got a battle pass. It's got all that boring stuff. 
Um, but at its core, the selling point of it is what if uh, Halo and Portal had a baby and that baby was a beautiful, mm. uh, bashful young little lad named Splitgate. Um, <laughs> so you're doing the Halo thing. You have your, your, those types of, we- of weapons and that pacing. Um, mm. But you have two portals. You can shoot one in and one out, just like the video game Portal. And so does everyone else. And so the games end up being a lot about controlling space and, uh, you know, using momentum from portals the way you would in the games to actually, like, do well in a multiplayer shooter. Um, Hmm. And I think it's pretty accessible as one of those because it's, you know, people are still really new at it and no one really knows how to use portals well yet. So Uh if you're looking to get into first person shooters, I think, uh, you know, despite the fact that it's a little bit more cerebral with the whole portal thing. Uh, Splitgate will get you get you on the path at least if that's something you want to do. Nice. Um, I've got a chat. Some I have always been a lover of crossword puzzles, um, but I recently have been enjoying doing them digitally with the New York Times app. Uh, that's been my latest activity on my commute is passing the time with crossword puzzles. So, um. You know, they're hot right now. Everybody seems to be talking about crossword puzzles for some reason. So um, d- get get on it. D- enjoy it. <laughs> Cross some words. That, that's fine. I think people are bored, Magellan. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth of it. Yeah, probably. Um, Mine actually is a little related to Twin Peaks. I was watching it recently as part of a comparison thing I was doing with Twin Peaks. And um, it's uh, the film The Vanishing by... Uh, now I can't remember his name. George Sluicer, I think it is. It's like a Dutch film from the 80s. And mm-hmm. I think if people mm-hmm. are into Twin Peaks, it's also very dark. But um, if they're into Twin Peaks, this is kind of right up that alley. Like it's a really compelling psychological thriller that tells its story in a very unusual way. Like the way it's structured in terms mm-hmm. of its reveals and um, where it goes from there is just really fascinating. It's about a guy. Uh, couple they're driving out on a holiday and the woman goes missing at a gas station and he's like trying to find her after that so and it goes in some unexpected Ooh. directions from there or even before that hmm. in a way very cool the and there's also an american film which i haven't seen which is supposedly terrible so careful yeah. which version you <laughs> see have you seen that one <laughs> i've heard okay. about the 1993 vanishing it's and not, astonishingly yeah. it's directed by the same director <laughs> like they brought him over from Oh, Holland to direct oh, the Amer- the Hollywood version, and like it was, everyone was like, "What did you do to your movie?" <laughs> what wasn't was Funny Games a similar situation? Yes, I think? the yeah, Funny Games he, remake. He yeah. definitely directed both of those. Uh, Haneke. So interesting. Yeah, that seems like more of like a self conscious, like almost like an art, like almost like Gus Van Zandt doing Psycho. Like I'm gonna redo my own film, like in a new context. Mm-hmm. This I think was more mm-hmm. of just like a hey, remake it as like a more standard Hollywood thriller, like a, a, supposedly. I haven't seen it, but it, mm. yeah. Check out the the Dutch original, and there's, uh, yeah, I, I'll I'll leave it at that. <laughs> nice. I'm interested for All sure. Right. Um, well, thanks everybody for listening. We're gonna move into our spoiler zone now, but if you are stopping the episode here, thank you very much. And Alan, <laughs> do you want to say the thing that you always say? You know I do, baby. Thank you to Magellan uh, for being the, uh, the, the Agent Cooper to my Truman. And thank you all for listening. And thank you again to Joel for joining us. And mm-hmm. thank you for listening to Peace Chats. Damn fine pod. Alrighty, everybody, it is now spoiler time. If you are listening to this, you have seen Twin Peaks seasons one and two, as well as the film Fire Walk With Me, or you don't care if we spoil those things. But no return spoilers, don't worry about it, it's not going to happen. Um, but now all of that stuff is fair game. Okay, so what's the deal with Bob and Leland, are they the same guy? Are they different guys? Is one a not a guy? How do we, as you were starting to ask us, Joel, earlier, I'm curious about your thought on it. Like, is Leland doing this stuff 
is he not like how do we interpret uh all of that messiness yeah i i think the show keeps it pretty messy in a lot of ways and to me the really clarifying element is the film and even that is kind of messy like the first time yeah. i saw the film it was like a very i had a very weird reaction where i was like kind of angry with how the film dealt with it in a way um because it dealt with it better than the show but it didn't quite go all the way like it made me wish for the first time mm. and i hadn't felt this way really watching the series i'd almost felt the opposite like okay yeah just keep it as the spirit thing this is in the context of this entertaining show like it just the incestuous angle is too dark or whatever I mean, although when you think about it that makes no like the incest still happens so I, but when people cling to that as like a way to avoid that subtext like well it doesn't really avoid it it just presents it in a less like honest way <laughs> like it's still all there you know but i think that right. was my kind of gut right. reaction and then when i saw the film it suddenly made me feel the opposite way like oh okay so this was really all like a psychodrama about laura and this poor abused girl like now i wish they would that for the film at least they had gotten rid of all the supernatural stuff and just almost made it a and drive-esque thing where they pull the curtain back and they're like but then i kind of thought about it after and i realized well in a way, the only reason I feel that way is because the film sort of pushed me in that direction. So it's like, you know, the the film, I think, does yeah, come the closest right. to that idea that, like, Bob is really just kind of a cover. And the reading that I've eventually come to after thinking about it and reading other people's perspectives on it and everything and just kind of what makes the most sense to me is the idea that it is within the world of Twin Peaks, the narrative there is a spirit world. There are these forces that are larger than humans that kind of interact with them and uh, feed off of them and, and propel them in certain ways. But there is also a certain level of like agency and responsibility the characters have. And the two things, as with everything mm -hmm. Lynch, are very deeply intertwined. Like it's, I don't think of Lynch films, the way I put it in one of my videos is, I don't even know if this is dictionary definition, if this makes sense, but it, it the the connotations I bring to the words kind of that, you know, that I, I think when I see them make sense. Mm -hmm. I said, it's not a show about dualism. It's a show about duality. So like, in other words, that what I take from that is it's not about these two opposing delineated forces squaring off against each other. It's about mm -hmm. these two mm -hmm. aspects being fundamentally linked and sort of needing to be sort of unified in some way. You know, I think ultimately at the core of all Twin Peaks mm -hmm. duality is Lynch's idea of like the unified field, this very spiritual aspect um, where mm -hmm. at, you know, th there are all of these connections. So I think with Leland and Bob, that's a case of that where there is this sort of external force. There is this individual kind of agent. And I've always felt like if we're supposed to just buy the picture that I think um, episode 16 gives to us more or less, where we Leland is, I'll be really interested to hear you guys' um, response to that episode and kind of what you make of it. Because when I first saw it, um, and I was mm -hmm. kind of disappointed in a lot of ways with how it sort of resolved the mystery in sort of a pat fashion. And after I saw Firewalk with me, I was even more frustrated with it because it seemed like it made this, it, it was like a very exorcist depiction of Leland Bob. Like, hey, he's now freed from this right. evil spirit and isn't awful. And even if you put aside any sort of moral or, you know if political is the right word but but these other sort of aspects of how you depict like incest and all of that there's also a real dramatic lack there because who the heck is Le if if Leland is mm -hmm. Bob when he's bad but he's like Leland when he's good but he's also increasingly kind of crazy the whole time we know him and like it it just i think it reduces the character of Leland in a weird way to try to make him not a villain. You know what I mean? So that's my sort of complicated answer to that. But I, I do see Leland as being, um, and I have a more, I'll, I'll get it. I can get into it more a little after if you want, but, uh, cause I'll leave it at that for now. But the, I do also have like sort of a spirit mythos reading of what the spirit's relationship to people is on the show. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alan, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on, on the Leland Bob thing. I almost want to push back on that a little bit, Joel. I think that's very interesting. Um, you are now one of the first guests we've had on who has also seen Mulholland Drive. And my favorite scene from that film, 
uh, is the jump scare, uh, the clavi iconic jump scare behind the yes. restaurant. Um, I guess I can talk around spoilers for Mahan Drive, but there's a really iconic jump scare in that film, and it's my favorite scene um, where a character gets scared by reality. And the the context of that scene is important because it's basically, uh, you know, Patrick Fisher's character is like, I'm in, he's in a restaurant, and he's telling this guy, I had this dream that this horrible thing happened, and it wasn't that crazy. Like, it's it's like feeding into my real life now. And I think if I go behind this restaurant, it's just going to yeah. be there. And like, lo and behold, he t- he goes behind the restaurant and there it is, his nightmare incarnate. And he just faints. And it's kind of funny, but also like it ties back in. Horrifying. And- <laughs> it's so scary. Oh, my God. And you know it's coming. That somehow makes it more scary. Like, <laughs> it's a literally shocking scene that you're anticipating the entire time. And it still gets you. He de- he delineates what's about to happen. He's like, I'm going to walk back here and then they're going to jump out. And then it happens. And you're like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> and I think in a way Twin Peaks is, is like recalling that where it's like, we can keep these things in our dreams forever. We can keep Bob as a spirit in the Black Lodge and just be like, okay, that's fine. Like I dreamt about him and it's scaring me, but it bleeds into reality in a way. And yeah, it is it is a little bit more scary to think like, oh, Leland was capable of this. But Try to not think about that that angle and try to think about it. What if it was really just Leland is a good man possessed by an evil spirit? In a way, that is also horrifying. Uh, like a truly, sincerely good person, which we know we, I again, based on like Firewalk with me, we know he's not. Uh, what if Leland was just like a good guy who woke up one day and had a murderous urge? There is something profoundly scary about that too. Um, but it's just not the read that I prefer because I think that Twin Peaks works better when it is criticizing the men and making them culpable for the awful things that they do. Mm-hmm. Like, that plot line in isolation makes sense. Yeah. It's like, oh, good man possessed, but goes yes. bad. But in the context of Twin Peaks, it has to be like, it was bad all along. Yeah, I totally agree. There's like, there is a sense in which that story could be totally satisfying and frightening and even psychologically compelling as like an allegory or something like that. You know, just this. And I've heard people make the argument. I think where it just falls short in Twin Peaks is like, you can't just graft that onto an incest story. It just, to me, it falls apart at that, at that point, because there's too many, there's too many aspects to how like society deals with that subject already, where it's sort of repressing and pushing it to the side. And I always make the analogy. It's like, what if somebody made like Schindler's list? And then at the end they were like, but the Nazis were all werewolves or something. I don't, you know, that's a silly comparison, but it's like, well, that kind of robs it of what is so, so horrifying to begin with already about it it's too many yeah. horror elements kind of piled on top of each other so i think in fire walk with me he finds a very compelling way to work with both that doesn't rob the psychology quite as much of of its of its richness there if that makes sense yeah well because this is a story that invests so much it's not just that laura palmer is like the the girl who screams in the horror movie, like she's a person whose diary we read, whose different parts of her life. We like watch her friends reenact. Like we live her traumatic experiences very deeply and invest in, in the humanity of Laura Palmer to the extent that if, (laughs) if they were then going to say like, and guess who guess who killed her it was like a little demon man it's like what the fuck (laughs) no i need something that's more than that you know um so yeah it is i do remember a bit of episode 16 and remembering that they play it as bob like bursts out of leland's body or whatever and runs away it's like they lean very heavily into that reading. Right. This 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 episode, like, or that episode is incomplete unless you go fix it with Firewalk with me. Um, yeah. And uh I think where I where I try to figure out I think where Firewalk with me gets a little muddled um in an interesting way, and I'm I'm looking forward to revisiting it, is that you know, Bob in some sense is this you know maybe you could say like bob is able to kind of like heighten or play off of pre-existing evil tendencies within us like bob can only push leland to do certain things because leland already had this sort of like sick incestual attraction or desire for his daughter or, or whatever um 
And so maybe Bob is a metaphor for these kind of like latent evils that we feel a pull towards um, and and don't do. Um, but then, you know, whatever could be could compel us to do it. But also in Fire Walk With Me, Bob is this metaphor for generational abuse. Like Leland is doing these things to Laura because he interacted with Bob when he was a kid, right? And like this sort of abuse happened to him well, as well. Interestingly, not to, I don't want to interrupt your flow too much there, but I just want to say that that comes in, I think, in episode 16. So we don't, I don't know that we actually get it in mm. Firewalk with me. We just kind of bring it to Firewalk with me from the show. Oh, okay. I think, unless okay. I'm yeah. listening so. But yeah, keep going. But yeah, I think that that's, that's an interesting complication when we're thinking about like how accountable is Leland for his actions? Cause there's that accountability yeah. question when we ask like, is Bob a ghost that possesses him or is he doing this himself? Yeah. And then also if we're like, okay, Bob's an allegory and now it's like, okay, well is Bob an allegory for like our inherent vices and evils or, or like the per people's particular evils or is he an allegory for like, you know, the pain that we inflict upon others because we had pain inflicted on, on us. Um, and I think that I, I don't have an answer for like, and maybe there isn't an answer for which of those things Bob is, but at least, you know, this watch through, that's what I'm really trying to work through and, and think about. So like, are you saying the tension there is between evil or darkness as something that like comes to I people think the tension or is it, come or yeah what's what do you can you clarify on that a little you know is are are we seeing the sort of like uh the sort of like root evil that is kind of like present in our human okay. existence and that some people choose to indulge and some don't or are we seeing a story of a man who has been like really significantly traumatized and harmed by evil things that were done to him. And like that just ends up getting passed forward in like a, a chain of abuse. Yeah. Um, and you know, depending on how you look at that, like the answer to what is Leland culpable for or responsible for, you know, he's not absolved in one case or the other, but it's like, it's a nuance that I think is, important yeah. to to unpack and and i don't necessarily have an answer of like where i land on that particular question it makes me think of lost highway too and that's actually in that video i mentioned even though it's all early lynch films i do include some audio from later ones and one of them is the mystery man saying to um fred madison i'm at your house right now you invited me in i don't go where i'm not invited over oh, the shot of like leland fuck. looking in the mirror and seeing bob you know so that that's that kind of wow. shows you my my reading or thoughts about that, you know. Here's another truth of the matter. I have two two quick points. Um, one is, you know, this being a TV show, uh, you get to see Lynch like have to rein himself in a lot. I think that's honestly why Fire Walk with Me, the first time that John and I saw it, it was so uncomfortable. Yeah. Was it's your first experience to like, oh, when you make these things explicit, it's so effing scary. This this moment in this yeah. episode is horrifying because it's the most explicit the show has gotten so far, but we can go so much further. And in Lost Highway and in Mulholland Drive, Lynch is constantly reminding us, like, yeah, here's what it looks like. Yeah, you, you're worried about it. Here's what that fear that's in the back of your mind actually looks like in, in visual form. Um, it's a really cool way to use the format, but I think that in, in some ways, like, network television just wasn't the place for him to fully explore the horrors of that space. Um, and... Yeah, I think that I'm really excited to then talk about the return with everything that we were talking about because getting on a premium uh network and and having more creative control, we get to see potentially like Lynch unleashing that it on the world of television. Yeah, it's the even with what how they expanded the medium with Twin Peaks, and I think particularly with this episode, there's still such a contrast between like early nineties network TV and like the cinema. I mean, even just visually the you know the the, yes. the frame and the um you know it's just a it's a different feel the limitation of the yeah. medium and 
I, I was reading a great um, piece on the nerd on the Nerdist's website, actually, funnily enough. It was our review of this episode slash a like recap. And the last paragraph I'm just going to read briefly here uh, kind of like explains, you know, what we were talking about earlier during the pod about like, do we how much do we really know after this episode? What do we like textually know without anything further? And they say here it simply had to be who it was uh, regarding like Leland being the killer. Uh, Laura Palmer's behavior as described in the show, a young girl who acts out sexually in extreme ways and then self-medicated with drugs and tries to make up for her, quote, bad behavior by overcompensating by doing good deed after good deed. Examples include Meals on Wheels and taking care of Johnny Horn. These are classic behavioral patterns from someone who has suffered systemic childhood sexual abuse. Like, a psychological reading of Twin Peaks can kind of solve oh, the show way faster than the show does. Mm. It, that's all been there. I mean, the Johnny Horn stuff, extremely problematic as it is. I mean, I in the since the last episode, watched all the deleted scenes on the Blu-rays, and there's like three different ones about Johnny Horn because they realized like, yeah, we can't, this doesn't work. But the fact that they brought it up means like, yes, Laura is like taking care of a child because she is in a way nurturing a, a childhood that yeah. she lost. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's all there. Th- there's a there is a um there's another there's an article from the time too. It's like. Again, one of the few articles that really dealt with the episode on its own terms, where uh, the writer just writes about uh, writes about that, like how if you look at the psychological profile of Laura, it fits in really well with like profiles of 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 child abuse victims. So like, um, I mm-hmm. I wish I could remember the name of it. I can send you guys a link if you want, but it's uh, it's from yeah, like right. I think the Chicago Tribune or something, like a couple weeks after this aired, and it's like pretty well written, but um. But it's just so unusual because that wasn't how most of the media dealt with it. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up is just it's interesting. This is the clo- This episode is really the closest that um, the show ever got to Firewalk with me in a couple ways. One just in its like, you know, it, its depiction of like the the abuse and the violence at the core of Twin Peaks. Um, also, in another way, I think visually like sort of impressionistically um the way it's edited which we can talk about um because the editor for this went on to be lynch's basically creative partner for like 12 years and this is the only episode she edited of of it but one thing i wanted to say about that that first thing about the firewalk with me is um this in a way is the opposite of fire walk with me because fire walk with me is all about immersing us in laura's experience and this is an episode where in some ways, even though she's so much the focus, she's like never been more absent. I think literally in David Lynch directed episodes, this is the only one that Laura herself is not in. Cheryl Lee is in it as Maddie and we see like a portrait of Laura, but she never plays Laura in this episode. And I think that's the only time that ever happens. Oh, episode nine, I guess she's not in either. Um, but most of the other episodes she like makes an appearance as like a dream sequence or a flashback, like the, she's murdered in the season two premiere or uh, in the pilot, of course, she's still a corpse there and all this stuff. So it's like, it's interesting that here we get her reveal and it's just so profoundly underscoring, like Laura's not here. Like we are looking at this as mm-hmm. outsiders to her experience and realizing in an indirect way what happened to her. And like, she's, her sort of ghostly presence in the series has never been stronger of like here, but not here, the subject, but absence, like something we can't reach. And then firewalk me totally overturns that and makes it the opposite. Right. So that was something I was just really, it's thinking. from her perspective yeah, it's from, it's like, it's really the inversion of lonely souls in some ways, which is sort of fascinating. Super duper excited to watch firewalk with me and definitely agree that the editing on this, sh- this episode in particular was like really strong and interesting and kind of like pulls you in in different ways than the show has especially Um, that last sequence where it's just like so fluid you know and cutting between bob and leland and just kind of incredible yeah like we've talked about the effects and the overlay effects on the show and been like oh like the overlays look really bad or like bob with the owl face (laughs) on him or whatever but like leland into bob looks basically seamless or as seamless as it needs to be because most of it's in cuts yes. which is like really elegant and it's totally differently um, lit differently shot like with close-ups and just like mm-hmm. 
it's it's just it's weird how how uh it's like weird but totally effective how he structures the like visual dynamic between when Bob is killing her and when Leland is killing her. Yeah. Right. And the I wanted to say so the editor who he works with on this, Mary Sweeney, she went on to cut um Lost Highway, Fire Walk with Me, Mulholland Drive, and she both cut and also wrote um the straight story. Like that's the only time he's ever directed something that he did not write part of the write like contribute to the screenplay of. Oh wow. So it's just mm-hmm. a fascinating they have a fascinating I some of the more recent Journey Through Twin Peaks chapters I did last year were on their collaboration. Like even though it's not specifically mm-hmm. Twin Peaks other than this one episode, it's it's I think it plays out interestingly in the return because she's gone by then like she they they were actually romantic partners right. as well and they got divorced around the time of inland empire oh. so there's like a whole fascinating oh wow just dynamic between them and i to me my favorite lynch films are the ones she edited you know there's just something there in that part of his mm-hmm. career that's like more kind of impressionistic and fluid and dreamlike that i find really rich and fascinating shout out to mary sweet yeah so she's yeah. a fascinating figure to me <laughs> so i always try to bring mm-hmm. that in that's especially really cool. with this episode um just cuz we're right, well, i am going to try to wrap up in a moment but uh my last sort of in the we're deep in the weeds at this point right we're deep in the woods if you will um, yes <laughs> maybe Maybe this question doesn't have an answer right now where we're at in the podcast, but did either of y'all notice that Maddie, when she yells down the stairs, uh, says, uh, Uncle Leland, uh, I smell something burning. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is it the fire that w- w- walks with you? Is that what that was? What do you think it is? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to David Lynch it for you. What do you think it is? <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I'm going to ask. I don't know. It's fire. That's what I'm going to say. Uh, I like that fire evil evil's happening uh yeah. joel is the answer in my head a return thing or can we like say it i don't remember anymore um how about i'll throw out a couple things from the show itself and if it matches yeah. that we'll say it's from the original because i don't i'll so the, one of the things the log lady says fire is the devil something in the who hides in the smoke i think she says they talk about the burnt mm-hmm. engine oil um it's that Okay, the burnt engine oil. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, that yeah, that's definitely on here because Jacoby smelled it in the park when now we know that it was Leland hitting him over the head. Um, oh, okay. And mm-hmm. so he says it smelled like burnt engine oil, and then mm-hmm. um, it comes up later in the series in the finale too when the log lady brings the little jar that comes from Glastonbury Grove. Oh. Um, <laughs> Twin Peaks is gonna get so good and weird. <laughs> I know. It's good that yeah. That uh, what else? Oh, oh, I think it might be the pilot where she says it's about something is about the fire. Oh no, she's talking about her husband. It, I don't remember which episode it is, but she's talking about her husband dying in a fire in the woods. Have you guys been watching the Log Lady intros with the episodes? Yeah. There's one. I think it might be a later yeah. one where yeah, she yeah, says, yeah. "I have. died." in a fire it wasn't a forest fire it was a far fire in the woods that is all i'm permitted to say <laughs> so make of that what you will mm. Mm. fire it's coming back that that fire you like is going to come back in style <laughs> stop it <laughs> wait i what's the what's the horse what's going on with the freaking oh horse? yeah what is the horse yeah. i mean it's a pale horse people have compared it to like or said it was like heroin i don't think it's that because like horse is slang yeah and because it's white that uh, seems a no. little on the nose to me, but I think it, I mean, I th- I think it. I don't know. I mean, the 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 death is the big like, you know, the most obvious kind of answer. And I know Mark Frost is really interested in that idea. And um, but it was a Lynch thing. Lynch is the one who brought it in. Uh-huh. I'm trying to think where else. I feel like I read something recently that was sort of like illuminating on that front. Well, one th- okay, so there is something really interesting in the um. Um, David Bushman just released this book, Interviews with Mark Frost, or Conversations with Mark Frost, last year. And he, uh, the Bushman, the interviewer, he actually brings up, when they're talking about the, the white horse, um, Frost is talking about the pale horse in, like, Revelations and all this stuff, and so we're going back. And, and Bushman actually mm-hmm. brings up, he says, I know that Lynch really liked the film, is it Blood of the Beast? It's like this weird sort of 
quasi art, quasi exploitation film from like the sixties, I think. And there's a scene where they slaughter a white horse. Like it's a documentary footage of like a, of a slaughterhouse. And uh, it's intercut oh. with like other stuff, like more innocuous, oh, like people playing in the street or something. I, I can't, I'm not probably doing justice to it, but like, and he was compelled by the idea that that image may have stuck with Lynch because Lynch explicitly mentioned the film. It doesn't mention that many films, you know, that left a big impression on him. And that was one of them. So he's like, I wonder if it came from that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that tells you the source. That doesn't necessarily tell you There's like eight references to Sunset Boulevard. Mm-hmm. Yes, right. <laughs> Sunset Boulevard and Vertigo and uh, um, what else? It's like, I feel like there's like one other film that he frequently name drops references. I mean, there's more than that. Like he's got stuff in Ball and Drive and all that. But like there's like two or three. But it's a relatively like small pullover. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Small mm-hmm. bandwidth. Um. Yeah. I just think that the horror, it's its the classic David Lynch <laughs> thing. There is no, like, easy, I think the cocaine answer is so boring and frustrating in the way that, like, Twin Peaks fandom can be sometimes. Um, I really think it's, like, she's seeing impending death. She's seeing, like, the pale horse yeah. is a common, like, concept in, in different mythologies. You see a pale horse before you yeah. die, whether it's her own death or her, or her you know, or mm-hmm. Maddie's. Um, it's it's saying something bad. It's something involving death is about to happen. I think that's all I have. Not all I have. We're we've been we're pushing two hours here. Um, <laughs> but uh, again, Joel, thank you so much for for being on. Uh, yeah, thank you guys. That was great. Yeah, this was really fun. Would love to have you on again in the future for some other shows. Maybe uh, people have suggested more David Lynch stuff to us. So I'll definitely try to rope you in if possible. But uh, oh yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, um, that's what we. What do you think the next show you do will be? Oh, we can't tell you that. Yeah, we, we, we're figuring. Oh, you it know? Out. No, oh, we, you've already got plans. Okay. Well, we, we, <laughs> we wish we had plans. We have no idea. Yeah, we don't. We have no clue. Um, yeah. I want to know, but alas, yeah. um, that's what we got. You already did the plug, so we don't got to do that again. All I'm gonna say yeah. is peace out, folks. <laughs>